very much looking forward to. Fine. Sorry, um, I'm a minute late because I was running from one event in Meglod Ganj. So I had to okay. drive down. Okay. Uh, so should we start, uh, His Excellency? Sure, of course. Fine, fine. <clears throat> so uh, welcome. Uh, Namaste ji. Namaste to all. Uh, I'm uh, Rajesh Gopna. I'm the Secretary General of uh, Human Rights Defense International. And on behalf of our president, Mr. R. Venkat Ramni, and all other office bearers of HRDI, I welcome all the participants attending this uh, webinar on human rights violations addressing uh, about in Tibet and Xinjiang. Uh, HRDI is supporting the cause of uh, marginalized sections of society and ha has also taken up the issue of uh, Baha'is, Bhutanese refugees, Tamil refugees, Hindu refugees from Pakistan and Bangladesh. HRDI has also raised issue of uh, a human rights violation in Tibet in the past. HRDI is concerned about the plight of Buddhists in Tibet. HRDI is equally concerned about the about our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters in Zengia who are suffering the crisis of existence. To discuss this issue of international importance, we have with us His Excellencies Dr. Lobzang Sangha and the Honorable President of the Central Tibet Administration, popularly known as Government of Tibet in Exile. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Professor Kandapalli uh, from Department of Chinese Studies, Johala Nehru Universities, Professor Abanti Bhattacharya, Department of Chinese Studies, University of Delhi, and Professor Anand Kumarji from Johala Nehru University, who is a staunch supporter of cause of Tibet. Uh, we are also have with us Mr. Sham Parande, who is the Secretary General of Antarashtri Sayog Parishad, and Mr. Munish Gupta, Secretary Foreign Correspondence Club of South Asia. Um, as our chief guest is scheduled to attend another program at 6 o'clock, so with, without wasting any time, I seek the permission of uh, our chief guest and keynote speaker, His Excellency, uh, to begin this program. Am I permitted, sir? Of course, yes. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Uh, first of all, I invite Mr. Sham Parande, Secretary General of Antarashtri Sayog Parishad, who has inspired Human Rights Defense International to organize this event. Sham Parande is one of the founders and guided philosopher of HRDI. Mr. Sham Parande. Sham Parande. Sham Parande, sir. Sham Parande ji, can you hear me? Thank you, Rajesh Gogna ji. At the outset, I would like to thank HRDI and appreciate also for organizing this very important and timely webinar. Human rights situation in China, especially in Tibet and Xinjiang, is totally in bad shape. And we need to understand and awaken the people all around us and globally because this might harm everybody around. I would like to quote or start by quoting President Xi Jinping, who spoke at the UNGA day before, on 22nd to be precise. And while he was, he delivered his address virtually, he said that he urged the whole world to join hands to uphold the values of peace, development, equity, justice, democracy, and freedom as shared by all of us. This is what he talks. However, under his nose in his own country, the actions are totally opposite. In Hong Kong, yesterday evening, you might have observed the young 
democracy enthusiast Joshua Wong was arrested for his for organizing pro democracy uh, agitation last year in 2019 though it was a brief arrest he was released soon but that's where the whole game is these are the two important issues and of course the third one is as i started hong kong also and we need to consider all three as a matter of fact because hong kong struggle is latest on our mind through the video shoots that we have seen for months together how peacefully they demonstrated and demanded it's like that in tibet we need to understand that the first uprising of course was in 1959 itself because the occupation happened early in the 50s the freedom of religion is restricted there beliefs and association to any religion is unlawful supposed to be unlawful and arbitrary arrest maltreatment of in custody physical and mental mental torture forced abortion and sterilization are all order of the day this is regularly happening this has happened for decades together and yet the president of that country says talks of democracy and equity and peace tibetans under the leadership of his holiness sri dalai lama ji had been carrying on a peace peaceful long time protest however they are all branded as terrorists this is something un understandable it's beyond anybody's understanding and in zinjiang anybody could be the disappearance happens regularly someone is sent to the detention camps and the detention camps i need to inform have has about 1 million people into them these detention camps because somebody's wife has worn her veil the person has been sent to detention camp somebody was offering somebody offers uh, his prayers post his lunch or dinner he is sent to the detention camp for that very purpose someone is detained for uh violating the one child norm this is the condition in china whether it's tibet or it's zinjiang or it's hong kong the human rights have no value they are violated day in and day out while the president talks about peace the president talks about democratic values he acts right opposite unless and until there is a global opinion which will create pressure on the country and the president the situation will never change we have to take upon ourselves this very important and crucial uh wow for the establishment of tibetan freedom democratic values that tibet has been struggling for and i am sure 
that will be will be delighted soon to listen to his excellency the president of central tibetan administration dr lopsang sange and with us today a renowned china specialist and tibetan specialist like professor anand kumar who has been struggling for tibet studying watching china and struggling for tibet for decades together professor shikant kondapalli is a well known name as a china expert as well professor abanti bhattacharya ji from delhi university these are very well studied personalities and will be benefited through their presentations i also have uh, shri munish gupta ji my friend who is secretary for foreign foreign correspondents club i welcome you all and thanks rajesh ji and hrdi for giving me the opportunity and for organizing this webinar thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, sham parande ji uh, now i request mr munish gupta the secretary foreign correspondents club of south asia uh, to share his views mr munish gupta thank you thank you rajesh ji and thank you sham ji for a wonderful welcome uh, welcome to you his excellency dr lopsang sange uh, very nice to see you again uh, we were very happy to receive you on a webinar at the foreign correspondents club of south asia a few weeks ago and uh, and and i wouldn't steal your thunder because some of the very important comments that you made in the context of the current situation that exists not just between tibet and china but also in ladakh now between india and china is it makes it very very relevant for us to discuss this issue of tibet the freedom for tibet the freedom for tibetan people and the human rights issue of the tibetan people so i would simply like to welcome you you are in the company of very august uh, academicians and 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 thinkers and i am also a part of hrdi and i thank you very much sir for taking this time to to come and join us and address us and i look forward to uh, hearing your comments today and possibly also reporting them so that people around the world can know more thank you thank you rajesh thank, uh, thank you manish gupta ji now i request professor abanti bhattacharya from department of uh, chinese studies university of delhi professor abanti bhattacharya ma'am can you hear me sorry i did not unmute uh, please ma'am to be invited to this very important conference and uh, in fact i'm very thankful to uh, gogna ji and uh, sham uh, parande ji uh, to uh, have me in this uh, very important conference because the issue is uh, because given my expertise i'm not a human rights specialist but my expertise is on uh, understanding is on india china tibet and for a long time i'm watching and human rights violation i see it from a territorial perspective and today is given circumstances i guess uh, the tibet issue we have to level this up at a uh, i think at a much higher uh, uh, level rather uh, uh, not restricting to just human rights violations in tibet or xinjiang but contesting this idea of uh, human rights which is uh, prevalent in and their justification prevalent in china so we need to raise this debate contest that and uh, also contest the whole concept of global governance based on chinese notion of human rights so uh, i think and here i think india needs to play a more active role in uh, parties not only uh in uh, contributing uh, i mean shaping the uh, debate on global governance and what human rights should be because western human rights is also uh, we have seen how even the west human rights violations are quite uh, common so therefore we need to have uh, our own dialogue about human rights and to present a challenge to the chinese concept of human rights and i'm i will try to present my thoughts uh, on this and thank you very much for inviting me oh uh, uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya. Yes. Uh, so I think we are expecting much more from you. You are too, too, too early. Oh, uh, am I supposed to start? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought uh, we will have uh, our Honorable Prime Minister Lok Sang Sangye. No, Mr. Lok Sangye uh, uh, would be in the end of it. Kindly start. I invited you to share your views, please. Okay, so let me begin then. Uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't understand this. Uh, just one second. So uh, let me uh, then uh, uh, speak on China's human rights violations uh, in Tibet and Xinjiang. I'll be uh, speaking right on this topic. Uh, and we know that uh, human rights violations uh, in Tibet and Xinjiang are well documented. It's a living experience for uh, all our Tibetans. So it is not a recent phenomenon. It has been part of Chinese domestic policy since the foundation of the PRC. So it is important for us to understand not just what is happening inside Tibet or Xinjiang, but why it is happening. To answer this question why, it is important to understand uh, what Tibet and Xinjiang mean for China. My contention is human rights abuses in Tibet and Xinjiang are integral aspects of Chinese nation building process and hence an aspect of territoriality. Since it is rooted in the prerequisites of nation building, it has driven the Chinese state to adopt a repressive policy towards the minorities. This is my basic contentions. And so what we need to also understand what constitutes this nation building for China. Two things we need to note. One, in the post-war era, Westphalian nation state system became the universal model for all countries, which means that a country must have a defined border and a defined population or specific group of people who would represent the state as its national body. Second, in case of China, after ousting the national KMT party from the mainland, the CCP was confronted with the task of uh, building a modern nation state. This task was challenging as this period coincided with the international system defined by Cold War bipolarism. At this time, primary challenge for the nascent Chinese state was security and survival. Therefore, security and territorial integrity were overwhelming concerns driving China's nation-building policies. Hence, we see that right after the foundation of the PRC, the very first task that the CCP undertook was invasion and occupation of Xinjiang in 1949 and Tibet in 1950. The next step that the PRC undertook was consolidation of its sovereignty over Tibet and Xinjiang. In the case of Xinjiang, Territorial consolidation was more about precluding the Soviet influence, which was still very strong in the Ili region of northern Xinjiang. And there were possibilities of clandestine operations of the Soviets in collusion with the KMT forces. In the case of Tibet, territorial consolidation was a greater challenge because Tibet was the only region which was not provincialized under the last Qing dynasty and which was under the British suzerainty. And this suzerain rights were bequeathed to the government of India post-independence. Therefore, China had to confront international condemnation of invading Tibet. In these circumstances, the PRC sought to establish territorial sovereignty over Tibet by signing the 1954 agreement with India. Now, by this agreement, uh, India relinquished all its rights on Tibet as a buffer zone and recognized Tibet as a region of China. For China, we see the 1954 agreement was critical for not only establishing its sovereignty over Tibet, but obtaining India's concurrence and legitimation on Chinese occupation of Tibet. However, despite the 1954 agreement, China could not consolidate its territorial sovereign claims on Tibet. With the outbreak of the Lhasa revolt in 1959 and the Dalai Lama's flight to India, Tibet became ostensibly a disputed region. Externally, uh, the Tibet issue got entangled with the border dispute with India, and this entanglement rendered Chinese sovereignty over Tibet a truncated one. Internally, since the 1960s, China's Tibet policy forced the Tibetans to undertake the most arduous journey on foot and escape to India. This very act exposed the flawed nature of Chinese nation building policies as underscored in their minority policy. 
Now, Chinese sovereignty over Tibet was further weakened with the outbreak of series of Tibetan revolts in September 1987, March 1989, then again in 2008, followed by series of self emulations beginning from 2009 that peaked in 2011 12. These unrest inevitably brought the Tibet issue to the forefront of global consciousness. Coupled with this Tibetan unrest, the linking of the Chinese invasion of Tibet with human rights violation from the 1960s onward further internationalized the Tibet cause. And uh, uh, arguably, more and more internationalization of Tibet engendered more and more challenges to Chinese sovereignty on Tibet. Also, it meant that Tibet could no longer be regarded as an internal matter of China, as upheld by the Chinese government, but an international concern. More crucially, with the found, founding of the Tibetan government in exile and the, with the presence of more than a million Tibetans spread across 39 settlements in India, there emerged a tale of two Tibets, one under the illegal occupation of the Chinese government in China and the other under the Dalai Lama at Dharamsala. This, in fact, constituted the most formidable challenge to the idea of Chinese nation and the goal of nation building. So I pose the question what this post-1959 Tibet means. It means clearly three things. First, Tibet is a disputed issue. Second, China lacks sovereignty over Tibet, hence a truncated sovereignty. Third, Chinese nation building process is incomplete. Given this idea of post-1959 Tibet, a question arises, what China is doing about the Tibet issue, which is disputed, a truncated sovereignty and an incomplete nation building. It devised a minority policy, which we all know. This minority policy has two sides, a theoretical side and a practical side. Speaking about the practical side, two steps were undertaken that were vital for Chinese security. First, regional autonomy system, are crafted to enhance CCP sovereign control over the minority regions. Thus, we have the Tibetan Autonomous Region created in 1965, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in 1955. The second uh, aspect of this practical side was the uh, uh, Western Development Program, which was unveiled in 2000. This was essentially a security driven strategy to address the problems of separatism, not to spread economic prosperity, which is otherwise the official uh, rationale for launching it. This Western Development Program. Uh, essentially combined five elements, canization, resource extraction, infrastructure construction, military development, and repression. And today under Xi Jinping, a sixth element had been added, has been added, and that is mass surveillance strategy. On the theoretical side of the minority policy, two things are important. One, a series of white papers on Tibet, latest being the uh, development of Tibet 2019 report, white paper, uh, white papers on human rights, white papers on Xinjiang, these are all published from time to time to present the Chinese position on, the, on these issues to the world. And they mainly uh, project a consistent theme of minorities being part of China historically. The rationale uh, of these um, white papers are basically uh, first to demonstrate that minority is an integral part of the Chinese state and uh, Second, to preclude all possibilities of separatism and Western interference. The second theoretical aspect is this Chinese government putting forward its own notion of human rights, basically arguing how Chinese notion of human rights is different from the Western tradition of human rights. It, uh, in fact, interestingly draws heavily from its history, particularly the Confucius and Manchus notion of welfare state that gives primacy to people's livelihood and economic well-being than individual goals of civil and political rights. This human rights conception is today subsumed under the broad Chinese principle of harmony and diversity that became a principal theoretical proposition from the third generation leadership from uh, Chiang Semin onwards. This principle of harmony and diversity is used as a tool to not only deflect Western criticism, but also to create an alternative conception of governance based on Chinese notion of harmony, which allows countries to have and maintain their distinctive histories, cultures, economic models, and state systems. Through this principle, 
China seeks to advocate that no country should impose its own values and models on other countries. This is basically a Chinese strategy to challenge the Western global norms. So another question which comes uh, props up, what does minority policy tell us? It tells us that Chinese minority policy is essentially a security issue. How? China's Tibet policy is a continuation of its historical quest for a stable periphery. Tibet and Xinjiang constituted a part of Chinese strategic periphery. In fact, minorities in, uh, in China constitute, although constitute a minuscule 8% of the entire population of China, they occupy only 63.7% uh, uh, nearly 63.7% of land all along the north, northwest, southwest, and southern periphery of China. Historically, a uh, periphery has been the site of repeated nomadic invasions. We see in the post-war era, it has been the site of, uh, it has been the focus of external inter interventions of the US in Tibet, of the Soviet Union in Xinjiang. Periphery thus uh, has dual security implications for China internal security as underscored in the minority policy and external security as reflected in China's policy towards India, Nepal, and the Tibetan government in exile. In fact, China perceives foreign interference as spiritual pollution or Western peaceful evolution strategy. However, undeniably, the human rights violation in Tibet and Xinjiang have offered opportunities to the West the US and US in particular, to intervene in the minority regions. Most recently, we see in July, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo citing human rights violation in Tibet, restricted uh, visas for some Chinese officials, thus indicating a continued US political interference in Tibet and the consequent vulnerability of the Chinese on the Tibet question. This then means Minority policy is not related to protecting minority identities, but it is all about securing China's sovereignty over the periphery. That is, minority aspirations have no place in Chinese nation building policies. Driven by security and sovereignty prerequisites, Chinese minority policy inevitably results in human rights violations. And under Xi Jinping today, we find human rights violations have acquired a more virulent dimensions with the use of surveillance technology. In fact, surveillance technology has gained a central place in Xi Jinping's minority policy of persecuting and repressing the people of Tibet and Xinjiang. Surveillance is, however, been a part of Chinese political culture. And this is interesting, and it, it, can, be, and it can be traced back into history, first to the Qin period, 221 BC, and later a more institutional structure appeared in the Song period with the establishment of Fauci system, a device to watch, check the number, movements, activities of the people through agents selected from local inhabitants. In the post 1949, monitoring people for any sign of dis dissent has been a common and rampant practice under the CCP. What we find under Xi Jinping, growing economic means and technical capacity have led to an unprecedented regime of mass surveillance. And therefore we see reports, several reports mentioning about, there are instances of 1 million officials and party cadres mobilized as uninvited guests to regularly visit and stay in the home of some of Muslim families of Xinjiang to monitor them. Their job is to scrutinize and report problems such as people who pray or show other signs of active uh, adherence to their Islamic faith, who contact family members abroad. And therefore we see without regard to any internationally recognized right to privacy, the Chinese government has deployed video cameras throughout the region, combined them with facial recognition technology, deployed mobile phone apps in input data from official observations as well as el electronic checkpoints and process the resulting information through big so data analysis. Two, two minutes, yes, I will do that. Data is then used to determine who is to be detained for re-education. Thus, we see one million or more uh, Muslims have been deprived of the freedom, placed in an indefinite detention of forced indoctrination, these detentions have created countless orphans, children whose parents are in custody, who are now held in schools and state-run orphanages where they too are subjected to indoctrination. 
arguably then mass surveillance strategy has emerged as an integral part of its nation building process and an essential tool of territorialization this is carried out under the innocuous term of sinicization as recent as august 28 this year in a two day forum on the future governance in tibet shi jinping highlighted the necessity of sinicization of tibetan buddhism and of building an impregnable fortress to maintain stability in tibet china is seeking to replicate the strategies of repression and mass detention adopted in xinjiang as steps towards sinicization and national consolidation in fact sinicization of tibet has acquired prerequisite focus under xi jinping given the uh, his urgency to fulfill the china dream and uh, that is uh, achieving the two centenary goals 2021 and 2049 and this sinicization has gained a strong decisive push after the 19th party congress in 2017 which is xi, uh, xi jinping's beginning of the second term and where xi jinping talked about achieving socialism with chinese characteristics for a new era and this timeline for fulfilling this goal is between october 2017 and october 2049 xi jinping uh, xi jinping is therefore in a great hurry and needless to say that these uh, goals are extremely critical to show up party legitimacy uh, at a time when china is facing economic problems due to the pandemics the intensification of sinicization however also suggests that the assimilation of tibet and xinjiang into the chinese notion is still incomplete and this explains the growing insecurities of the chinese state and this insecurity is reflected in growing chinese militarism on the Uh, militarism on the uh, LAC. In fact, through pursuing unilateralism and militarism on the LAC on the one hand, and through signification of Tibetan Buddhism and complete annihilation of Uyghur identity on the other, China is seeking to address the goal of nation building that started in 1949 and is still incomplete. What I am seeking to establish here is the fact that the minority issue or the Tibet question is unresolved and open to contestation, and this is where. chinese vulnerability lies in this contest what could be the options for india of course revising one china policy is certainly an option and i guess india is doing it as we see in uh, as we have seen in bjp general secretary shri ram madhav's attending the tibet soldiers funeral from the perspective of human rights issue i guess india should steer a debate questioning and debunking chinese notion of human rights and second construct an indian notion of world governance pitting against the chinese notion of world governance and in this regard i think human rights defense international could wage a concerted legal war to challenge the chinese rule by law instead of the standard rule of law thank you thank you very much professor uh, abanti bhattacharya ji uh, now i request uh, professor anand kumar from jawaharlal nehru university and professor anand kumar is always with us whenever we took up the issue of the botanist refugees and all other issues uh, and uh, if you say about the activism in delhi and the intellectualism in delhi then the best combination is professor anand kumar sir uh, thank you so much uh, i am so pleased that your organization has decided to focus upon the tragedy of our neighborhood particularly tibet and shinjia I want to begin with an apology to all Tibetans and Uyghur people. They must be believing by looking at our constitution and our history that Indians are a people who believe in satya and ahimsa. But we are, at the moment, victim of a policy system which is fearful of asatya and ahimsa. as my friend professor shrikant is there and there are other scholars who may be speaking in english for the benefit of some of your participants i want your permission to speak in hindi please sir most welcome aaj ka jo vishay hai wo hamare liye bahut zaruri vishay hai tibbat ke liye jitna zaruri hai ugar logon ke liye jitna zaruri hai usse zyada bharat ke logon ke liye zaruri hai aur main aapko badhai deta hu ki aapne desh ki मीडिया देश के राजनीतिक दल और देश के विश्वविद्यालयों का जो तरीका है उससे अलग चल के हमने आप सबकी मदद से आज तिब्बत का सवाल हिमालय का सवाल और सिंगजियांग का सवाल उठाने का फैसला किया सबसे पहले तो मैं एक भारतीय होने के नाते और बहुत ही 
आत्मविश्वासी भारतीय होने के नाते जिसे इस बात का गौरव है कि उसने दो साल दो सौ साल लंबी लड़ाई लड़के अपनी आजादी हासिल की तिब्बत के मित्रों से हम क्षमा मांगना चाहते हैं और हम उगोल लोगों से क्षमा मांगना चाहते हैं आप सोचते होंगे कि हम भारत के लोग सत्य और अहिंसा के पुजारी हैं लेकिन जो नीति तिब्बत के बारे में है सिंजियांग के बारे में है चीन के बारे में है वो असत्य और हिंसा के आगे पूरी तरह से सरेंडर करने की नीति है उसको सवाल पूछने की हमारी कभी कोई हिम्मत नहीं पड़ी मैं ज्यादा बातें अन्य विद्वानों के लिए छोड़ूंगा आपके सामने मैं आठ प्रश्न रखना चाहता हूं और वो आठ प्रश्न चीन के मिथ के बारे में है क्या सचमुच चीन वही है जो आज चीन के नक्शे पर है और जिसको चीनी दूतावास बताता है और जिसको भारत पहचानता है ये तो उन्नीस में कहीं था ही नहीं ये तो बिल्कुल नया राजनीतिक भूगोल है जिसमें उन्होंने खुद वो मानते हैं कि जिसको शिंजियांग कहते हैं चीनी भाषा में उसका मतलब है न्यू फ्रंटियर ये नया इलाका है उनके पास नहीं था उन्नीस तक तिब्बत उनके साथ नहीं था उनके पास जो राष्ट्रीयता की कल्पना थी डॉक्टर सनिया सेन की उसमें वो मानते थे कि हान लोग तिब्बती लोग मंगोल लोग उगोल लोग ये मिलके एक भविष्य का राष्ट्र बनाएंगे जिसमें सबकी मर्यादा होगी सबका सम्मान होगा सबके अधिकार होंगे वो वादा तो छूट गया लेकिन हम एक हारे हुए देश के नाते जो हमको हराने वाला देश है उसी की भाषा बोल रहे हैं दूसरी बात ये तिब्बत में मानव अधिकार का सवाल कहां से आ गया जो देश गुलाम है विच इज वन ऑफ द पोस्ट सेकेंड वर्ल्ड वॉर कॉलोनीज इन द मॉडर्न वर्ल्ड सिस्टम वॉट कैन बी थिंक ऑफ इन टर्म्स ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट फेसिलिटीज आई एम वेरी हैप्पी विद द प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ प्रोफेसर अबंतिका भट्टाचार्य शी टॉक्ट अबाउट द चाइनीज मॉडल ऑफ नेशन बिल्डिंग विच इज अटरली फेल्ड इन ऑल द एरिया पर्टिकुलर टिबेट एंड शिंजिया तीसरी बात कि हम अपनी पूरे सोच में तिब्बत के बारे में शिंजिया के बारे में सोचते ही नहीं हमारे विदेश मंत्रालय का सारा ध्यान बेजिंग पर रहता है लासा के बारे में भूल चुके हैं तो आज हमारे सामने जो नीति है भारत की जिसके लिए कि आज आप संवाद करके एक सवाल उठा रहे हैं उसमें पहली नीति तो यही पहला सवाल तो यही है कि तिब्बत और शिंगयांग के बारे में भारत के केंद्र सरकार की जो नीति है वो भारत के कई प्रादेशिक सरकारों की नीति और इच्छा के खिलाफ है ये लद्दाख के खिलाफ है ये उत्तराखंड के खिलाफ है ये सिक्किम के खिलाफ है ये अरुणाचल के खिलाफ है अरुणाचल के विधानसभा को पूछिए सिक्किम के विधानसभा को पूछिए उत्तराखंड और हिमाचल की विधानसभा को पूछिए और आप अपनी लोकसभा में पूछिए दोनों दो दिशा में देखते हैं दूसरा भारत का रक्षा मंत्रालय और भारत का विदेश मंत्रालय तिब्बत के बारे में दो तो अलग अलग तस्वीर देखता है रक्षा मंत्रालय की निगाह में अपनी जान की कीमत पर भारत की सेवा करने वाले सैनिकों की निगाह में भारत की सुरक्षा के लिए तिब्बत की आजादी के लिए काम करना जरूरी है बगैर तिब्बत की आजादी के भारत की सुरक्षा असंभव है और विदेश मंत्रालय की निगाह में तिब्बत को छोड़ के बाकी सब सवाल के बारे में बात करो तो किसके बारे में बात करोगे संयुक्त राष्ट्र संघ के बारे में अमरीका के बारे में हांगकॉन्ग के बारे में तिब्बत भारत की सुरक्षा की जो दीवार टूटी उन्नीस में उसका सबसे बड़ा कारण तिब्बत की गुलामी थी और जब तक तिब्बत पर चीन का कब्जा है ये पूरा हिमालय क्षेत्र जो कभी चीन का नहीं था और शायद आने वाले भविष्य में नहीं रहेगा लेकिन आज तो वो चीन के कब्जे में है और कभी गलवान घाटी में कभी अरुणाचल में कभी सिक्किम में कभी उत्तराखंड में और कभी हिमाचल में चीन आपको थाउजेंड कट से खून बहाने को मजबूर करेगा और आप कुछ नहीं कर सकते क्योंकि आप तिब्बत का सच भूल चुके हैं तीसरी बात कि हम चीन की दृष्टि से तिब्बत को देख रहे हैं या भारत की दृष्टि से देख रहे हैं चीन की दृष्टि से भारत अगर बोलना शुरू करता है तो वो तिब्बत को चीन का ऑटोनोमस रीजन मानता है और भारत की दृष्टि से तिब्बत चीन द्वारा हड़पा गया शिंजियांग चीन द्वारा कब्जे में किया गया भूगोल है और अगर आज तिब्बत हट जाए तो चीन के नक्शे का एक बटा खत्म हो जाएगा ये कोई किलोमीटर दो किलोमीटर का मामला नहीं है ये 2.5 मिलियन स्क्वायर किलोमीटर एरिया कब्जा में किया है इन्होंने विच इज सो प्रथेटिक सो इलीगल द होल वर्ल्ड टॉक्स अबाउट इट एक्सेप्ट इंडियन स्कूल्स, इंडियन कॉलेजेस इंडियन डिप्लोमेट्स एंड इंडियन पॉलिटिशियंस 
They have no idea about the reality of or myth of one China and reality of Tibet. Chota Saval Leki, Suraj or Swayatata. Come look Kabi Kabi Aj Sangi Jisabi look Puchengi. Kiap Ajadi Chate, Kiap Autonomy Chate. Pishle Dino Shitaki Kerchati, this make Tibeti Lamane Hamse Ulat Kekaha. Kiap Ajadi Kebari Hamko Bolle Denge. Hamto Hamnahi, Chudia Bi Ajadi Chati. Pashu Pakshi Ajadi Chata, Hamto Manusha, Hamtoni Ajadi Changi. लेकिन अगर हम आजादी के लिए बोलेंगे तो आप हमको धर्मशाला में भी नहीं बैठने देंगे दिल्ली में आपने शपथ ग्रहण समारोह में 6 साल पहले बुलाया था चीन ने नाराजगी जाहिर की फिर शपथ ग्रहण दोबारा जब हुआ 2019 में तो आप हमको भूल गए सबको बुलाया आपने हमको भूल गए क्यों क्योंकि चीन को खुश करना तो ये स्वराज बनाम स्वायत्तता का जो सवाल है ये तिब्बती मित्रों से मत पूछिए ये अपने से पूछिए कि क्या आपके अंदर ये साहस है कि जो देश 1912 से 1949 लगभग आधी शताब्दी आजाद था उसको 1949 से 1959 में गुलाम बनाया गया आप उस सच को बोलना चाहते हैं कि नहीं चाहते हैं बेचारे तिब्बती क्या बोलेंगे आपको बोलना पड़ेगा भारत की आजादी के बारे में महात्मा गांधी 1929 तक कंप्लीट इंडिपेंडेंस की बात नहीं कर पाते थे लेकिन ब्रिटिश पार्लियामेंट में भारत के मित्रों ने आवाज उठाई अमेरिका में आवाज उठी रूस में आवाज उठी और फिर भारत के स्वतंत्रता संग्राम को भी यह साहस मिला कि वो पूर्ण स्वराज का सपना कराची सम्मेलन में 1930-31 में पारिस पास करे फिर भी उनको 15 साल लगा भारत वालों को 26 जनवरी मनाते मनाते 1930 से शुरू किया और 17 साल बाद 1947 में तो हम तिब्बती मित्रों से कहना चाहेंगे कि आप आजादी का सपना मत छोड़ना आपका जो पुराना तिब्बत का नक्शा है उसको मत भूलना उसको तिब्बत ने चीन ने काट के टुकड़ा टुकड़ा कर दिया और हमारी सरकार ने नई जो नया नक्शा बना उसमें तिब्बत को पीपल्स रिपब्लिक ऑफ चाइना का इंटीग्रल पार्ट बना दिया पीपल्स रिपब्लिक चाइना के जन्म के पहले तिब्बत था आपने उसको जो जन्म से 60 साल बाद का देश था उसको 60 साल पहले के देश के बारे में कह दिया इंटीग्रल पार्ट है और उसे चीन नहीं सुधरा आखिरी तीन सवाल ये हैं कि हम दलाई लामा के बारे में परेशान है कि भारत के बारे में परेशान है दलाई लामा क्या चाहते हैं यह नंबर दो का सवाल है भारत क्या चाहता है भारत अपनी सुरक्षा चाहता है कि नहीं चाहता भारत अपना सम्मान चाहता है कि नहीं चाहता आप चीन के आगे झुक गए तो सारा दक्षिण एरिया एशिया सारा एशिया पैसिफिक रीजन वो भी चीन के आगे झुक गया आप पिछले 6 साल में 18 बार चीन गए तो नेपाली प्रधानमंत्री बेचारा क्या सोचेगा भूटान वाला क्या कहेगा ऑस्ट्रेलिया वाला क्या कहेगा वियतनाम वाला क्या कहेगा म्यांमार वाला कहेगा कि इतना बड़ा देश भारत है दुनिया का सबसे बड़ा लोकतंत्र इतनी बड़ी सेना है इतना इनके पास संपत्ति है और ये जब चीन के दरबार में झुक झुक के आदाब बजाते हैं तो हम क्यों झगड़ा लें पहले चीन और भारत आपस में सुलझा लें फिर हम देखेंगे और जब तक भारत दबा रहेगा हम भी चीन की जीहां जीहां करेंगे तो नेपाल ने भी नक्शे की लड़ाई शुरू कर दिया पाकिस्तान का तो कहना ही क्या अच्छा सब दो मिनट सवाल ये है भाई जी कि तिब्बत की नीति है कि हिमालय की नीति है भारत के पास न तिब्बत की नीति है न हिमालय की नीति है अगर हम 1959 से चल रही समस्या को सुलझाना चाहते हैं तो लेट देयर बी अ हिमालयन पॉलिसी फिर हम आंख मूंद के जिंदा रहना चाहते हैं या आंख खोल के जिंदा रहना चाहते हैं वी आर लिविंग इन डिनाइल ऑफ टिबेटन ट्रेजेडी जितने लोगों ने भारत के आजादी के लिए फांसी की सजा झेली थी उससे ज्यादा लोग तिब्बत की आजादी के लिए आत्मदाह आत्मदाह कर चुके हैं भिक्षु और भिक्षुणी वियतनाम में एक दर्जन दो दर्जन लोगों ने आत्मदाह किया सारी दुनिया में हलचल मच गई और तिब्बत के सवाल पर दो मिनट से ज्यादा लोगों ने आत्मदाह किया और हम चुप हैं मैं यहीं पर अपनी बात को खत्म करता हूं बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया प्रोफेसर अनंत कुमार और जादू है आपने आपको मैंने पहली बार 40 साल पहले सुना था तो भी आपको सुन के जोश आया था और उसके बाद हर 10 साल में सुनने का मौका मिलता रहा मैं चाहूंगा कि ईश्वर मुझे बहुत बड़ी उम्र दे लंबी उम्र दे ताकि मैं वर्षों तक आपकी बातों को सुनता रहूं शुक्रिया बहुत नाउ आई इनवाइट प्रोफेसर श्रीकांत कोंडापल्ली फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ चाइनीज स्टडी जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी प्रोफेसर सर मोस्ट वेलकम नमस्कार नमस्कार let me thank the organizers uh, 
the HRDI and uh, the distinguished uh, speakers and participants. Um, it is indeed a privilege to be with you. Uh, let me straight away come to the topic on uh, the human rights related issue and how the strike hard policy has been implemented uh, across Xinjiang and Tibet and the overall policy perspective of China. Um, one may be wondering why there should be a human rights related issue in China. If the constitution of China, the People's Republic of China, mentions in its 1982 constitution about freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, many of those which have been inscribed in the Indian constitution also are inscribed with obvious caveats, that is assembly of more than three people in which we also have in India or in other uh, related aspects. Uh, the caveats have been expressed, but uh, the surprise thing is when you implement these, there are various issues that have come up as previous speakers have mentioned. Now, human rights violation is, is nothing new in China. Uh, as uh, previous speakers again reminded us. Uh, but what is important is that since 19 party Congress in 2017, when President Xi Jinping unleashed a program for the next say 30 odd years till 2050, as Abonti mentioned, the rejuvenation and uh, China dream, um, they also have some provisions which appear to be now in implementation stage. Uh, for example, you may have seen the last few days the in Inner Mongolia, there has been a campaign to uh, remove the Mongolian language and institute the Putunghua, the Mandarin uh, language in the schools. So uh, this has been an extension of the policies that China has been implementing in Xinjiang and in Tibet for a long time. So the 19 party Congress now is looking at more in terms of consolidating the communist party as part of its rejuvenation. Uh, one of the things that generally most people ignored or rather uh, mentioned this as part of Taiwan is the six no's policy. Xi Jinping in the 19 party Congress mentioned about no person, no individual, no institution, no uh, so six no's uh, has been mentioned, can uh, divide China from the rest of its parts. So the six no's policy has been a, um, a major thrust area in the 19th Party Congress. Now, generally people have uh, adopted this to Taiwan, but it has potential implications. In fact, it has implications for Xinjiang or Tibet or Inner Mongolia or other ethnic minority regions in China. What we are seeing since 2017, 19 party Congress is a kind of ethnic rebooting. Uh, China dream, China rejuvenation also has a certain rebooting of this. Uh, and this rebooting is important because previously since 1949, there were efforts by some leaders to suggest to integration, national integration, much as Indian, Indian government follows the national, National Integration Council and other towards the, uh, towards the indigenous people in India. So the national integration policies have been uh, one which interchangeably have been implemented. Uh, if you look at say late 1970s, uh, during Hu Yaobang's visit to Tibet or in uh, other periods. Uh, so, what is significant now is that assimilation is the watchword towards the ethnic minorities. Uh, this has been experimented in Xinjiang. So there has been a very rich experimental uh, groundwork laid down in Xinjiang as part of the strike hard policy. Uh, Chen Chuanko, the party secretary in Xinjiang served in Tibet before in 2011 to 16. Uh, much of what we actually saw in Xinjiang were implemented initially in Tibet, such as for every 100 meters, there are these police stations uh, in Lhasa and in other places between 
2011 to 2016. Uh, much of the surveillance that we saw in Xinjiang was initially implemented in, in Tibet. Um, there is the, the, for instance, the uh, QR codes. Uh, each household has now a QR code through which they would uh, uh, digitalize the entire population and their profiling is done through this surveillance, surveillance process. So what we saw is in this process, uh, at three levels, the assimilation has been uh, implemented. One is at the human beings level through surveillance and so on. Second is assimilation of resources, uh, water, minerals, uh, oil and gas, uh, uranium, gold, um, you know, you name it, they have been pumping out into the rest of China from these areas. The third is cultural and religious rights have been uh, violated. So the rebooting and assimilation here has also occurred in the cultural and religious spheres. So um, mainly the critics have been arguing that there has been a genocide. The Turkish uh, leader, uh, President Erdogan, uh, has criticized the Chinese action in July 5th, 2009 uh, in Urumqi when about 189 people were killed. Uh, subsequently, China deployed some 24,000 soldiers uh, and there was the civil war between the Uyghurs and the Han Chinese. So in this process, what we saw is uh, the, uh, essentially we saw uh, the genocide at various levels. Erdogan used the word genocide at the time, but immediately revoked that concept. Uh, some Indonesians have used this concept. Some uh, Thai uh, Muslims have used this concept to explain China's policies vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Uh, but in general, in the last, say, 10 to 15 years, we have seen this genocide at four or five levels. One is the demographic. Um, uh, Abanti spoke about the Hanization that has happened. Uh, so the previously we saw the Han Chinese migration uh, in a in a slow paced manner, but this has increased partly because of the Belt and Road Initiative and previously the Western Development Campaign. So as a result, we have seen the Han Chinese becoming the majority in the minority areas. Uh, so this is a big change in terms of the demography. Uh, second is the sterilization uh, campaign because the constitution for the minorities previously guaranteed uh, no restrictions on population while there was the one child policy which has been lifted in the rest of China in some cities. Uh, that was not applicable to the minority areas but now today there is the reverse on the reverse, the sterilization campaign, uh, especially among the Uyghurs uh, and other Hui uh, nationalities. So this has led to a kind of demographic um, uh, profiling and reduction in terms of the population in their own land, uh, despite the constitutional guarantees in this regard. The second uh, uh, genocide we have seen is in the religious sphere. For instance, in, um, in uh, Xinjiang, there is the, uh, the Quran has been sinicized. Uh, many passages in Quran has be, have been uh, deleted uh, and uh, uh, the whole script has been uh, modified here in Xinjiang. Secondly, you cannot have a beard, you cannot have uh, Muslim names uh, uh, which, are, which have become uh, slightly more radicalized. Uh, Friday prayers are also being uh, shut down. Um, and a similar experiment has now been unleashed in Tibet as well. Uh, previously in Tibet, we cannot see a, uh, the Dalai Lama's photograph in the monasteries. Uh, this has been removed. And also as part of the self-immolation campaign uh, that was uh, that was there a few years ago. Um, uh, due to this, there has also been restrictions in the religious uh, spheres. So, so a second major change that has happened is in the religious sphere, which is 
uh, is actually hitting the identity of many of these nationalities uh, in China. The third sphere is in the cultural domain where you have the, uh, the mother tongue of the local uh, ethnic minority uh, has been discarded and now Mandarin, the Putonghua is being taught uh, in these places. In Tibet, this has been experimented for several decades before. But what, if, what we see is the official sanction as well as the, um, the uh, uh, restrictions on other uh, mother tongue, uh, uh, you know, imparting of the courses in the mother tongue. So a cultural genocide in a way has, has also has happened. In economy as well as in environmental issues, there has also been a major thrust because of the Belt and Road Initiative projects. Um, you may have seen the 130,000 Tibetans now being herded into uh, uh, into ghettos, ghetto living, which is which has never been the part of the culture of the Tibetans uh, before. So this is an area where uh, we probably will see major developments happening. Um, uh, so in relation to Xinjiang, we have seen uh, since August 2018 when the United Nations Committee on Eliminating of Racial Discrimination identified these uh, vocational education and training uh, camps, uh, which uh, uh, have in turn more than a million uh, Uyghurs. Uh, a similar pattern is emerging in Inner Mongolia and in Tibet uh, with, the, with the recent Tibet Walk uh, Forum meeting um, uh, in late August this year. Uh, in Beijing when all the Politburo members attended this. Uh, and as Avanti mentioned, there is the sinicization or rather uh, socialism, Tibetan socialism, including Buddhist practices to be uh, uh, you know, converted into the socialist project, like what they have done to Quran in uh, uh, Xinjiang. Uh, most of these successes for China are traced to Chen Chuanko, uh, who once fam who once infamously called the Dalai Lama as a wolf in sheep's uh, uh, dress, um, and uh, uh, the same person who served in Tibet uh, is also now the Politburo member and likely to succeed, uh, if age permits, uh, the 68 years of Politburo Standing Committee, uh, very likely to be promoted in the next 20th Party Congress. Uh, because of the kind of model that he had evolved in Tibet, as well as in Xinjiang, it is likely that he will be elevated for the in the uh, in the political hierarchy. Uh, so, essentially, then we saw the three evils. Uh, three evils concept has become more uh, uh, mainstreamed uh, in the Chinese parlance not just in China, but also all the SEO countries accepting, including India. In 2006, for instance, when Hu Jintao came to Delhi, um, Manmohan Singh and Hu Jintao included this term in the joint statement that India and China oppose the three evils. Now, what are these three evils? Separatism, extremism, and splitism, which are basically linked to the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, the uh, Taiwanese uh, and the other ethnic minorities in China. So the joint statement mentions about uh, between India and China. So in other words, legitimizing not only in the domestic context, but also in the SEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, countries uh, and seeking their blessings for China's policies. Uh, we have not seen, for instance, the Chinese saying, we will oppose the cross-border terrorism issues. Uh, but the uh, government of India did mention about the three evils, opposing the three evils construct uh, by the Chinese. So we have willingly bought this concept uh, from the Chinese uh, and included in uh, the joint statement. Uh, so essentially then the August 29th uh, uh, meeting, the late August 29th meeting, the Tibet Forum meeting, uh, essentially now brings the Communist Party much closer uh, to the Indian peripheries. Uh, what we also have to watch is the 158 Buddhist monasteries uh, in the Trans Himalayan region. Uh, whether this 
three evils would would creep into these monasteries uh, with the Chinese activity increasing both in finance, both uh, second in religious matters, uh, third in terms of the human resources. Um, uh, so this is an area that we need to carefully watch and see how the Chinese party state is expanding, not just in Tibet, but also in the trans Himalayan belt uh, areas. Uh, the, the events in Inner Mongolia recently and in Tibet and Xinjiang previously uh, suggests that this project is having a larger uh, thrust from China. Uh, and we are going to witness uh, a number of other developments uh, in future regarding the, the genocides that we saw in various dimensions, uh, demographic, economic, cultural, religious, and in the environmental areas. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gandapalli. Uh, I, uh, I assured the uh, support staff of His Excellency that uh, our all the speakers would conclude their uh, speeches by 5.30 and we are just two minutes late. And uh, now I request uh, His Excellency uh, uh, to share his views. And uh, the best thing is that His Excellency received his degree of BA Honours and LLB from University of Delhi. And being a member of the Executive Council of the University of Delhi, I invite your, His Excellency to come to Delhi University as soon as this uh, uh, COVID business is over. And we will have your speech in Delhi University and uh, the Vice Chancellors and all senior officers would be present, along with the principal of Hansaraj College. She's trying to join this meeting and maybe very soon you may be able to see the principal of your institute. So, uh, 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 Dr. Lobzang, after receiving his LLB degree from University of Delhi, um, got a Fulbright scholarship from Harvard Law School and completed his LLM, LLM degree in the year 1995 and had spent 15 years at Harvard University. Now he is the president of the Central Tibetan Administration. And being the president of the Central Tibetan uh, Administration, he is the symbol of Tibet, Tibetan identity, Tibetan struggle and the Tibetan existence. We feel very honored that you are with us, His Excellency, Mr. Lobsang Kampar. Please, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, being an uh, DU alumni, it's an honor to be invited. Definitely, uh, I would like to come and you know, uh, be with my uh, uh, you know, alumni and also uh, students and the faculty members who were very kind enough uh, to teach me things and you know, groom me to be uh, the person I am. So I'm very proud to be a DU alum and uh, leading the, uh, the Central Tibet administration. Um, but having said that, I must you know, fully uh, acknowledge uh, uh, DU Professor Avanti Bhattacharya Ji. Uh, she's here and from a uh, uh, China studies and you know, speaking about Tibet and Xinjiang uh, is, uh, is a welcome site. And uh, obviously, an, another preeminent university, uh, Jawla Nehru, from uh, you know, uh, which uh, Professor, longtime friend, Anand Kumarji, and uh, Sirikant uh, Kondapaliji, also, uh, both of whom I know I've met, uh, both of them, and their you know, uh, support is much appreciated. Today, you know, I uh, got this invitation and uh, uh, without hesitation uh, uh, decided to participate even though I have uh, you know, seven events uh, today, uh, mainly because to see sinologists or China experts, you know, speaking about human rights in Xinjiang and Tibet in a public forum. Uh, this is a welcome site. I think this kind of discourse is much needed uh, and, uh, you know, for which I really want to thank human rights uh, Defense International for organizing this, uh, primarily because uh, if you go to the West in America or in Europe, uh, Tibetan Studies program are there at Harvard or Columbia or Virginia, you know, many of the Ivy League uh, universities in America have, and also in Europe, including Oxford and Cambridge. But in India, it's lagging, you know, uh, even within China Studies program. Uh, very few uh, Tibetan students and researchers uh, 
uh, make it. And uh, that is also uh, because you know, professors like Kondakali and Avanti, they take under their you know, um, wings uh, some Tibetan students and they go on to become uh, researchers, scholars. And you know, some of them are also here with us uh, at the Tibet Policy Institute in Dharamsala. So I think uh, uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, uh, you know, say briefly on uh, human rights situation in Xinjiang and Tibet. I think most of the issues are already covered. Uh, two commonalities are obviously um, Chen Gongo, the party secretary who was in Tibet, uh, is the architect of, you know, uh, you call it education through labor or concentration camps in Xinjiang. And now the same system is coming back uh, to Tibet in the form of uh, labor camps. And this is uh, exposed by uh, no less than uh, Andrin Zen. Um, he was the key researcher who exposed uh, the concentration camps or the labor camps in Xinjiang, where one million Uyghurs, or more than one million Uyghurs, uh, held. And uh, similarly, just a few days ago, he said around half a million Tibetans from the rural areas, both from the farming and nomadic areas, they are called surplus laborers, who forcibly transfer. There might be some who, who might volunteer, mainly uh, transferred to a military-like camp where they are given military-like training uh, to, quote unquote, to be skilled uh, so then they can get some opportunities. But they're uprooting them. Uh, from nomadic and uh, traditional nomadic and farming, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle. Similarly, Human Rights Watch have also come out with a report a few years ago, where even two million or so nomads from the mountains were removed and put in ghetto-like system uh, near or at the uh, urban uh, uh, centers of Tibet. Uh, this way, they can as Professor Kondapalli said, and others also said, they can fulfill the assimilation drive. Assimilation is an age-old strategy of the Chinese government. It has you know, gone on for hundreds of years, and that is to convert Tibet into a Chinatown or a Chinese province and make Tibetan into Chinese. So this is what they're doing. And so cultural assimilation, when they have this you know, uh, technological mechanism to enforce the assimilation. And that they through, do through grid system, which is both manual and technological. Now through grid system, everybody's issued a sophisticated ID card. Now from the look of it, when you have a sophisticated ID card, you know, which is good because you can identify yourself, the government can identify yourself and provide social services. But there's a uh, you know, very advanced um, chip in the ID card and, and then physically, they put a lot of, uh, uh, you know, what do you call, uh, check, check posts all over Tibet. Each time you swipe your ID card, your movements are tracked. Now, accordingly, there's an algorithm and there's a software which collects all the data and they can identify which farming area, which nomadic area, which town has more movements of people, more the movement, more suspicious we grow and it comes under suspect group. And then there'll be more surveillance and there'll be more manual surveillance mean physically. So not only they have spies, and not only they have policemen, but they also have what they call encouragers and discouragers. You know, they have paid some money to do that. That means they encourage participation events like you know, the Chinese government events. And they discourage people, their own neighbors, from participating in, you know, illegally though, in His Solonist, you know, during His Solonist birthday or any other uh, traditional days. So this is how they control the whole Tibetan plateau and Xinjiang. And this grid system is implemented both in Xinjiang and Tibet. And they have, you know, what they call um, neighborhood watch, which they adopted from the Soviet era. But in Soviet era, neighborhood watch was essentially of 1,000 family members or so. Now this is broken down to 100 family members and 100 family members do the neighborhood watch through by rotation. So now you have 100 family 
uh, 100 families in one group, but once you start a drink through a rotation, each neighbor suspects the other and each neighbor, you know, will be jealous of others and think that, you know, one will inform the other's activities. And so this is how you create this environment of suspicion and fear. This is how they control Tibet. Because of this grid system, because of this neighborhood watch, which is so intrusive, right, that even at least in the 1980s, there used to be protests by Tibetans, group of 10 or 100, at times 200. To, till 2008, there used to be a mass protest all over the Tibetan plateau. Now, these protests are limited and more or less disappeared because through this neighborhood watch, the grid system, the surveillance, prevents them from doing any kind of activities. That's why they are forced to, you know, resort to self-immolation. Because if you want to protest, likely would have you been getting arrested before you organize a protest is very high. Once you organize a protest, if you talk to some people, you are likely to be arrested. Once you organize a protest, you get arrested. Once you're arrested, you go to prison, you suffer for a long time, you get tortured, and sometimes you disappear. Hence, genesis of self immolation lies in this repressive system imposed on Tibetans. That's why 154 Tibetans have committed self immolation. So this is the system in, in Tibet and also uh, similar in, in Xinjiang as well. Now on the other front, on the cultural assimilation, there was one data in Tibet Autonomous Region, the so-called Tibet Autonomous Region, 92% of printing and publications are in Chinese language, which means only 8% are in Tibetan language. That means more books are printed and published in Chinese language, thereby encouraging people to read, write, and understand Chinese language, thereby forget and dilute Tibetan language. So incentives, resources are invested in Chinese language. And also at the uh, education front, university level, medium of instruction is Chinese. High school level, medium of instruction is Chinese. Middle school level, now even at the lower primary school level, they are saying they're trying to enforce Chinese as the medium of instruction. So they want to educate the younger generation in Chinese language and less in Tibetan language, right? What it does is now, even Tibetan history at Tibet University in Lhasa are taught or encouraged to be taught in Chinese language. Now, each word that they use, each sentence you use in Chinese language can be monitored very, very carefully. So once you start teaching Tibetan history in Chinese language, the Tibetan teachers cannot use those terms in Tibetan language to make students understand the true nature of Tibetan history. So this is how they're doing it. They're trying to take uh, nationalism, the sense of ethnic identity, the cultural values, even out of history. Now, recently Xi Jinping said, sinicize Tibetan Buddhism, which means they want to teach even Buddhism in Chinese language, translate Buddhist texts in Chinese, which means they want to take the Tibetan narrative, the Tibetan experience, how Buddhism came from Nalanda or from India to Tibet. It's a long journey. It's a long, rich history where major contributions were made by lots of us, the translators, who translated from Sanskrit to Tibetan. This narrative is very enriching and also has this element of national identity and sense of pride that even in seventh and eighth centuries, Despite all the difficulties, Tibetans managed to come to India, learn Sanskrit, learn Buddhism, take it to Tibet and translate it into Tibetan language. This is a major you know, aspect of Tibetan history. You know, nowadays in the world, either the generals are heroes or politicians are heroes. In some cases, business people are also heralded as heroes. Only in the Tibetan society, Translators, the lots of us were heralded as national heroes because they brought Buddhism from India to uh, Tibet. Now, Xi Jinping wants to sanitize that aspect of Buddhism also, Tibetan Buddhism, and you know, sinicize 
and make it to be taught and translated in Chinese language. So this is what they are trying to do. In the case of Xinjiang, yes, there's a demolition of mosques that's going on. In the case of Tibet, demolition of temples or monasteries happened in 1950s and 60s, right? 98% of monasteries in Nanadis were destroyed. Fortunately, after the Cultural Revolution, first thing Tibetans did was to revive, rebuild monasteries and nunneries. So at a social, individual capacity, Buddhism is back. Now again, the Chinese government is hitting hard on Buddhist institutions. Now they are, they have destroyed, as we know, half of Serta Monastery and half of, you know, uh, half of Serta uh, Larungar and uh, now uh, half of Yashingar nunnery. So the demolition and destruction of monasteries and nunneries are continuing. And through the grid system, through the neighborhood watch, even in monasteries, the control is becoming more and more interested. That's why Freedom House, which comes out with the annual report every day with Freedom Index, has reported for the last five years in a row, Tibet is listed as the second least free region after Syria. We all know the conditions of you know, people in Syria. But how many people in India know that the human rights conditions of Tibet is the second worst in this entire planet? So this is the situation. That's why Tibetans are protesting. So yes, um, at a broader level, uh, you know, uh, at least through, you know, because of the Galwan uh, tragedy and, and the Doklam, uh, the interest uh, about Tibet is growing uh, in India. Uh, which is a good part. But for the last 60 years, I think it's all in as Dalai Lama and Tibetans, we've been you know, raising our voices time and again. As uh, Professor Anand Kumar said, said you know, the security of India is dependent on the Tibetan plateau. Now Xi Jinping said, stability and security of China is dependent on security and stability of Tibet. Hence, we must, you know, have advanced development and protection of the Tibetan border. So they want to invest resources. Right? And then we must also echo the same thing. And India and say security and stability of India is dependent on the Tibetan plateau because 3,488 kilometers long border between, you know, between now between India and many media and intellectuals call it India and China. Right? It was always between Tibet and India. Shagaba once wrote a letter to the Indian government saying, at the moment, we have only 75 sepoys from the Tibetan side patrolling the border between India and Tibet. If India doesn't come to our rescue, the price you will pay will be much higher. Now, just in Galwan Valley, Ladakh, we are talking about 30,000 troops you know, from each side. So the price India has paid for, you know, acknowledging or recognizing Tibet as part of China has been enormous. So we must review this policy at an intellectual level and come to a conclusion that yes, Tibet as a buffer zone between China and Tibet, China and India serves as the epicenter of peace, as a zone of peace. And each time you say Indochina border, right, you are essentially welcoming Chinese soldiers. I was interviewed by many media and they're saying, why are they you know, um, uh, intruding in our uh, border areas, in the Indian border areas? I said, because you say it's China's border. And they say, yes, we are coming to our border. Chinese soldiers will say, I'm coming to this border area because you say it's China's border. And we have been saying it's Indo-Tibet border. And then you must also acknowledge in 1986, His Holiness Dalai Lama wrote to then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi that yes, at one time to recognize Tibet as part of China, it's understandable. Now situation has changed. India should review it. It's been 35 years. You know, not even discourse has taken place. So yes, Human rights violation is taking place partly because not many countries spoke and are speaking about Tibet because the Chinese government think they can act with impunity. The act with impunity is based on a confidence that neighboring countries 
and other major countries will not speak about Tibet. Now, the good thing is America is speaking about Tibet. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo just a few days ago spoke about Tibet. European countries are speaking about Tibet. Japan and Australia, they all are speaking about Tibet. And India also should do the same. Yes, at the grassroots level, at the people's level, there's a bit of awareness. At the intellectual level, human rights organizations are speaking about Tibet. But we must magnify this voice and make it louder, make it a national debate, a national review, and a review of national policy on Tibet. That way, you know, we can help improve human rights conditions of people in Tibet and also in Xinjiang. So with that, I want to end. And if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. So thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, of you know, uh, Human Rights Defense International. And uh, what a privilege uh, to be with Professor Kondapali, Avantiji, and Professor Anand Kumar, and all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Uh, we have a few questions, so I'm directly, without scrutinizing them, I'm directly going to the questions which have been shared in the chat box. And uh, the first question is uh, by Professor uh, Anand Kumar. He says, what is this 50-50 vision of Tibetan? Kindly explain. Please, sir. Yes, a uh, 550 vision. So when I took the oath uh, in 2011, I wanted to send a message to Beijing that if they think that after 50 years, Tibetan movement, the freedom movement in exile will dilute and collapse, we said they are wrong. Because the younger generation, an exile-born Tibetan is taking over the leadership, political leadership. So hence, I reflect the aspirations, the passion and determination of the younger generation, exile-born generation. So at that time I said, yes, we have lasted 50 years under the leadership of His Holiness Dalai Lama. If need be, we will last for another 50 years. So that's the message I sent. And then later I started formulating a policy called 550 vision, means five years and 50 years. So we must, you know, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So with that, our policy and projects of CTA is based on working towards solving the Tibet issue based on middle way approach for genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people in Tibet, but at the same time, preparing for a long haul for 50 years plan. So accordingly, we are restructuring, reconfiguring the Central Tibet administration and Tibetan movement as a whole. How can we make CTA and the Tibetan movement a transnational? How can we make CTA uh, uh, an administration and a movement which you know, rolls or works for 24 hours, seven, seven days a week, 365 days? So when the people in Dharamsala, CTA, sleeps at night, people in Europe will get up and take over the movement and the administration. When the Europe starts sleeping, Tibetans in North America, in Canada and US will take over and keep the movement alive. And then when they sleep, people in Australia, New Zealand take over, Japan take over, and then come back to Dharamsala. So how can we have uh, e-governance, uh, electronic uh, digital, technologically sustained and widespread kind of movement. So that kind of movement we are thinking. That's uh, Mr. President, one Mr. Oscar has a question. He asked, uh, what, what are the views of Mr. President on the way the Chinese are forcing the Tibetans to fight against their brothers in India? Um, what is our stand of Tibetans fighting against brothers in this India? Is, this is the question which he has posed. Yeah, I didn't get the question. Uh, the question, he says that what is the stand of Mr. President about the fact that the Chinese are forcing the Tibetans in China to fight with the, with the Tibetans who are living in India. So it is a fight between the Tibetans and Tibetans. Yes, there are some forced recruitment. Um, that these are the reports uh, 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 we hear. It's very disturbing. Um, uh, and, you know, as, as, uh, as I said, uh, Tibetans feel that no country has done more for Tibetan movement than India. So Tibetan people have been generous. So Tibetans inside Tibet or outside Tibet have a lot of respect and love for people in India and this great nation of India. Because each time we open up Buddhist scriptures, it starts with Om, Jagar Ketu in Sanskrit. Huh? So 
the first sentence is om and always in sanskrit or indian language so we pay homage to india this holy land the land of buddha with bodh gaya you know and then we open our then we read our prayers so that much of respect uh, we have for india so obviously you know unless force uh, no tibetan uh, will uh, ever fight uh, against india so amar uh, dr amarijiv lochan has a question that uh, what do the people of uh, tibet expects from the human rights organizations uh, from of india how can we support the cause of tibetans yes i think there are many human rights organizations in india and many or many have international accreditation you know uh, so some are members uh, uh, of the united nation human rights council uh, when they participate in any human rights forums they must speak up for the tibetan issue so this is also an appeal to the government of india that at the human rights council and other uh, forums Uh, UN human rights experts, they are scholars, they are researchers, they are independent experts like you know Adrian Zen, who is uh, trained and educated in Germany, who is an expert on the China's quote unquote minorities. So he came out with a major report on Xinjiang. I mean that blew up the lead of human rights condition in Xinjiang. Now he has come out with a report on Tibet with half a million Tibetans in labor camps. Right. Similarly. human rights organizations researchers should re- research about tibet and inform the international community you know and indian government also should allow them to speak as an independent researcher at international forums so this is very important because we've been speaking uh, for the last 60 years <clears throat> often we were dismissed as victims obviously you will speak only about sufferings but in 2018 i said either you transform china or china will transform you so as at geneva forum in switzerland right and i was quoted by news media also saying that now this year the secretary of state mike pompeo said exactly the same thing either we change china or china will change you so not not you know not because we are victims <coughs> but because we deal with chinese government we are been the victims we are made to suffer we know the system we know the movement we know their pulse so when we tell you something you must believe that it's coming it's happening and 2017 i said when i go to europe and i say this today to india also when i went to europe i said today i have not come here to seek your support to save tibet i have come here to tell you to save yourself because china is already in tibet these are the things that drink assimilation destruction of environment you know all that now they are doing the same thing in europe similarly chinese governments tentacles are in every aspect of india whether we it industry whether it is you know software technology business you know in universities you know it's entering right so yes india should save itself from china they are already here so this you must bear in mind so that's how that's why what we say is very important because we can feel the pulse we can ring the alarm bell and hence you know we've been saying for the last 60 years what happened to tibet will cost india a great in in terms of economy and defense now yes india is spending billions of dollars defending the border whereas historically when tibet was independent we didn't even have to spend you know a uh, uh, few lakhs at most a crore rupees now you are spending crores of dollars and his excellency the the name of the force on the indian chinese border is indian tibetan border force it is not indian chinese border force so that is also a point um that's true it's called indo tibet border police yes 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 uh, so <laughs> they are named uh, that but if you look at if you open any news media now if yes. you any intellectual papers if you read any government statements they all say indo china border yes yes and next they say how come the chinese army are at the border because yes. you china border they are there the border is with the tibet then how can we there be china yes very right and the mr mk gupta has a question he says how to promote research on tibet and tibetan buddhism in india please if you Sure. And I think universities should establish, you know, Tibetan studies program, and the government should give grants, you know, 
What we do is I have established Tibet Policy Institute here and Tibetan researchers and PhDs uh, holders are invited to work here. And every year we invite any uh, researchers uh, uh, in India, uh, including uh, with Professor Gondapali and others who are studying or doing research from Madras University. We you know, give them three days uh, of time where they can all come together and work together, share their thoughts. And then we also invite you know, uh, senior scholars to come and share their thoughts. So at the moment, even though we are in exile, we are a refugee entity, we are providing quote unquote sanctuary or a place, a safe place for all the researchers to come. Now, only thing you have to do is create a researcher's position an assistant professor's and professor's position and a think tank in various universities. So, you know, uh, Indian population will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, well-trained and well-informed. For example, I read Professor Kondrapali's uh, uh, interview during the uh, Galwan Valley incident that you know he had to speak in four, five or five languages. You know because he's so much in demand. Why? Because he studied Tibet. He studied China. He speaks all these languages. Now during the Doklam incident in 2014, I remember so many quote-unquote experts were speaking appeared on national TV, but they were confused about the word Doklam. In Tibetan, Doklam means nomads road, Thoklam means difficult road, Dolam means a road. So what is the meaning of Doklam? Is a nomadic road, nomads road, or a difficult road, or a road? Because that one word has a meaning and you can identify that, right? So people didn't know the term Doklam, but they all were talking about Doklam. Why? We don't have expertise would read and write Tibetan term and Tibetan word, and hence the border, 3,488 kilometers long border, all have Tibetan names. The rivers have Tibetan names, the valleys have Tibetan names, the mountains have Tibetan names, roads have Tibetan names. Unless you know the Tibetan word, you can't you know, demarcate and define what it is and where it is, you know, because you have to do the research. And most of the documents are in Tibetan language. So that's why it's very, very important, you know. So, you know, it just takes, you know, uh, government will and some private universities also uh, can uh, establish a chair or research position. Today, you know, um, the Peace University in Pune have established uh, Dalai Lama chair, you know. They're a friend of mine. They're doing so. Some universities are doing that. This is how you do it. That's great. Um... What are you sure? Being member of the Executive Council of the University of Delhi, we are next. Our next meeting is on first of November, so I'm going to move a resolution that we should have a um, Department of Tibetan Study in University of Delhi. Let, let let me make the things move. Let us see what happens. That I will do definitely on first of October. Thank you. And now I request uh, our honourable uh, President of Human Rights Defence International, Mr. R. Venkat Ramni, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. Uh, to conclude this program and give vote of thanks on behalf of Human Rights Defense International. Thank you, Gognaji, and I must thank uh, Dr. Lopsa and Sangai. Uh, we welcome on behalf of the HIDI and all those uh, very erudite academics, Professor Kondapalli, Mr. Professor Randal Kumar, and Professor Bhattacharya. HIDI has a very ambitious program. Its uh, basic slogan that we understand is, how do we stop over a period of time, colonization of minds and the colonization of spaces? I think if human rights ultimately mean, they mean only these two things. And when I remember in 1949, when that famous book, The God That Failed was published, and I, I also understand more than 101,60,000 copies of the books are sold. Oda Kiesler, one of the authors in that book, was talking about a very, very far, you know, uh, 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 visionary way. How probably the God that failed message will have to be not only for a, 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 a battle against the Soviet Union, but essentially against understanding the limitations of, you know, ruling people through space and mind. So today, when HRDI want to take up this issue, we know, regardless of the limitations of HRDI, Tibet 
as uh, the author of the book Meltdown in Tibet wrote, Michelle Buckley. I just read out what he wrote. It's a very important message. He says, what appears to be just a Tibetan plateau problem or a Chinese problem is going to be an Asia-wide problem. Ultimately, this will become a global problem because there are no boundaries when it comes to environmental impact. Very profound words. Therefore, we're not really talking about, well, I'm entirely, you know, very informed in a profound way by the three contributions made today. That's why I want to summarize by saying that if HRDA can contribute to the Tibetan cause in many ways that we're probably contemplating in times to come, but probably will be sending a very important message that the Chinese understanding of colonizing the world through mind and space must come to an end. And if this must come to an end, all the forces across the globe, in whatever form they can be gathered, in and therefore, I think HRD will probably be doing all that in times to come. And uh, I'll probably, I was also reading the report given in 2018 uh, by the Central Tibet Administration. I just read what uh, the Tibetan intellectuals and cadres who work in the Communist Party, the Communist establishment in Tibet, make their judgment of Chinese Communist rules in these terms, very instructive terms. I quote, in the first 10 years, we lost our land that is communist China invaded Tibet. In the second 10 years, we lost political power. The government of old Tibet was replaced by the communist establishment. In the third 10 years, we lost our culture. In the fourth 10 years, we lost our economy. I think that can, there should not be any more 10 years when Tibet will be effaced out of earth. I think it's important for us as Indians that if your commitment to human rights beyond frontiers is important, we will have to commit to Tibet unconditionally. HRD probably will try to do its best in this regard. I end by saying that every heart that beats, every hand that is raised, every syllable that is uttered, every feet that is ready to march, and every cry for freedom and justice are with you. And I thank you for this wonderful webinar today. We will be always trying to be with you. Thank you so much. And my special thanks to the three academics who made a very enriching contribution today. And I'm sure the HRA will try to gather their thoughts and please them together in some uh, narrative where we can probably think of uh, uh, carrying further, or, you know, narratives on human rights in more, uh, in more utilitarian, not the utilitarian way, in more profound ways than what we've imagined so far. Thank you for your presence today. And wow. uh, thank you, Gogna, for this wonderful evening. And this recording, the program, recording of this program is available with our organization. It is also being broadcast on uh, the Facebook page of Human Rights Defense International. And if anyone wants the recording of this program, they may approach us. We will send him by uh, WhatsApp or any other mode. Thank you very much for being with us, His Excellency, and all the all other speakers. Thank you. तो पल्ला तो साला मरत नहीं